Rachel. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. How are you doing today? Doing great. Well, good. I'm excited to be here. Good. I'm glad to have you here with us. So whenever you come here on the podcast, it's always because it's a special occasion. So what is today's special occasion? Do you want to share? Well, today we're celebrating that your book, Survive and Thrive, will be released in ebook format. Yes. Is it Tuesday? Today. Today. So I'm sorry. It's today. Yeah, today is now Tuesday. Wow. It is Tuesday. We is had it? a snowstorm last week, and I'm a little bit off with our rhythm. <laughs> Um, but yes, I'm very excited about your ebook, which comes out today. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> today, next week, but we're... Wait. So... Wait, because we record videos in advance. Yes. Your ebook comes out today. <laughs> yes, it comes out today. Today, <laughs> March 2nd. Like it, it's February. No, today, March 2nd, the book comes out. So, yes. So, Survive, <laughs> so survive and Thrive... Uh, how to build a profitable business in any economy, including this one, does come out. Uh, it will release in bookstores in July. Yes. And so that's where you'll be able to find the paperback in everywhere in the world, of course. Uh, and then, but we were able to rush the ebook version of the, um, with the publisher. And so we were able to, I encourage them that we wanted to release this as soon as possible. Right. And so the ebook is actually available today. Uh, you can go to surviveandthrivebook.com to learn more or go search for it on wherever you'd like to buy your ebooks. And uh, yeah, that's what we're here to talk about. Because it's available today on March 2nd. Today is, yes. Today is March 2nd. Yes. Yes. Great. I'm so proud of you. Well done. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. So, um, uh, yeah, so would you like me to share a little bit about the book? No. People listen to the podcast. It's called Survive and Thrive, right? I mean, it's all the same thing. So I want to know, how do the book and podcast work together and what makes the book different? Great. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, so the, uh, the podcast is really part of the book in the sense that, um, you know, this time last year actually was when our world really changed dramatically yes. um, between uh, lockdowns and pandemics and all kinds of new vernacular entering our language like social distancing and all those fun things and phrases um, like oh no i forgot my mask yes that's a, became a new phrase uh to learn so in the midst of all of that um during a lockdown actually when our new brick and mortar business that we're in right now uh co-work columbia when that was closed then i felt kind of you know overwhelmed by the situation of course just like everybody else but then I started identifying, okay, what exactly is going on? And I recognized that there were three crises happening simultaneously. There was a health crisis, right? There's a physical health pandemic, pandemic safety, yes. you know, sickness. Mm -hmm. There was a mental health crisis because of all the, the shock to the, our society. I mean, really the destruction of life as we knew it, you know, the, all of that. That's a mental There's health too crisis. too many changes at once to yes. adapt quickly. Likely to cause some sort of trauma mm -hmm. globally. Right. Um, and then there was an economic crisis. And I looked at all of yes. those and I realized that there were a lot of people working on the health crisis and I believed and prayed that there would be a growing number of people focused on solving the mental health crisis. Right. But where I decided to really focus my energy was the economic crisis. Right. So that's where this book comes from was really in the midst of that I said, okay, I want to create a, a guidebook for everybody that's really trying to figure out whether it's the current business owners who are trying to adapt their business model to the new economy or the 30 million Americans, and then countless all over the world, who were recently promoted to entrepreneur. Um, Meaning recently unemployed due to economic crises and job changes. And yes. are have, uh, with the unrestricted, uncharted path before them, right? Yes. Which yeah. for you is clearly entrepreneurship. Right, and that may, not be the, that may not be the case for everybody, but for anybody who wanted to try and pursue that, I wanted to create a guidebook that would really be a step-by-step -step plan that would make that attainable, but also focus on the timeless practices that wouldn't just be relevant during COVID-19, but also beyond that. So that's where this book came from. But as part of that, I interviewed 25 of the best and brightest minds in business that I knew of. And I, that became this podcast where, so I was able to actually interview those uh, mentors of mine and include their insight in the book alongside my own experience and then extensive research. So um, yeah, so that was my 2020 project, I guess, my DIY project for 2020. Oh, that's a good way to put it, because yeah. a lot of people had their DIYs. Yes, mine was, DIY. that was my DIY project for 2020. Creating a guide for the economic crisis. Um, yeah, I, I love that um, 
you've done the interviews and then you've taken those that content that you've learned and the data you have with your background and created a guide, but the podcast still continues because we still continue mm-hmm. and like that economic recovery, which helps the mental health, like feeling like we're building something together and you know, it all, it all works together. So. Yes, exactly. So, um, so if you've been listening to the podcast, you've been listening to all the early interviews and you've heard some of the inside expertise that ended up in the book, but there's a lot more than that. There's a lot more in the book that wasn't in the podcast. And even the podcast itself, I distilled down really the common themes and the most important takeaways that applied not just to right now during, you know, as we're coming out of the COVID-19 crisis or going into whatever the next version of this crisis is. I pulled out the insights that didn't, that applied didn't, not just to now, but that were timeless. They were really about building a business from scratch without venture capital, without outside backing, right. building a profitable business from scratch that would stand the test of time um, so you wouldn't be dependent upon what economic. It would stand the test of time in any economy. In any economy, including this one. Right. Yeah. Great. That's great. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I have a bunch of sticky notes. I see that. I love Can that. Can I ask you questions? Are, Please. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Um, so you said, um, okay, so we've talked on the podcast why entrepreneurship is so important to you, mm-hmm. which comes back to the infinite game of eradicating generational poverty. That, yes. That entrepreneurship is how you pull yourself, your family, and your... You, the, your next generation, how you build a better future is the entrepreneurial ladder, mm-hmm. always moving forward. Um, and so when you say wealth can't be created from scratch, it can only change form unless you're an entrepreneur. So could you talk about how, like with your economic background, how money makes the world go round and yeah. why money is so important into like fixing your finances and creating that step sure. in entrepreneurship? So that concept, which is in, I think, the first chapter of the book, Mm -hmm. um, really is about setting the stage for what it means to be an entrepreneur because I view that as a really noble, important role in the world. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of also my cheeky take on the entrepreneur version of the, uh, you know, the first law of thermodynamics, which which is that... Matter cannot be... Well, I think the... Okay, we can... Energy cannot be... I think the first... So there are two laws uh, that are related, but I think the first law of thermodynamics, I believe... Uh, is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only change form. It can only change form. Well, so I kind of took the same thought as I was really thinking through the world, and I thought, okay, um, if I go and, like, if I go take my money and put it in a bank and save it, and that money, you know, gets interest from the bank because the bank's able to loan it out to other people, and they're able to make interest on that, then, like, there's some money kind of changing hands, and like we're doing pretty good, but it's kind of like it's sort of, it's it, it is kind of circular. It's kind of like the money's changing hands and going around, and like it, you know it's sort of like wealth cannot it can change hands, it can change forms, but it's not really created. The only time that wealth is created is when an entrepreneur steps in and says, "I see a real problem, and there uh, are real people who have this real problem, and I have a real solution," and they create a business according. And when they do that. You actually create new wealth. You make the world a better. You you generate new wealth, new progress, new change, new goods and services that didn't exist before. Mm-hmm. And so that's really kind of where I got excited about this idea that entrepreneurship is about making the world a better place, literally. You know, by moving, pushing the envelope, moving things forward. Um, so that's where I got this idea that the what I call what I call the book. I think the first law of entrepreneurship or something like that, or the. The first law of financial dynamics. Yes, the first law of financial which, dynamics. Which I made up. Which I'm, it says which that. Which I made book. up. It does say that. <laughs> the first law of financial dynamics, which I made up, which says that wealth cannot be created or destroyed, it can only change form unless you're an entrepreneur. That's great. So, thank you. Yeah, great. What are the sticky notes you got? Um, so this one set is in your chapter about, um, it says a word about problems. Ah, Yes. So, I wanted to get into um, that book we wrote, read about uh, the resistance. Every page was like the resistance. The, the War resistance. of Art. Yes, thank yes. you. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Thank you. Um, so he talks about the resistance and why it's always an uphill battle and why there's always something to be solved. And I wanted to pair that with the entrepreneurial problem solving. Like, yeah. how do you, as an entrepreneur, uh, tub thump? as it were. You get knocked down and you get back up again sure. over and over and over. Yes. So in our family, we should explain, we use this phrase a lot about tub thumping. 
yeah. because it's the song Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba, which most people don't know that either the name of the band or the name of the song, which is why I love referring <laughs> it to it by name. Uh, so the song Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba, you've probably heard it before. It's the song, you know, I, I get, get knocked, knocked down, down, but I, I get up again. again. You ain't never going to keep me down. So our kids know this song. We play Tub Thumping, which is where we all like push each other down, but then we get back up again. Like the kids love it. Mm -hmm. um, we have boys. So. Yes. So, yes. So your question is, how does one, how does the, the how does the entrepreneurial how does thumping? the entrepreneurial entrepreneur tub thump? Well, I think it's important to put some little context here. I talk about this in the book, but that um, a definition, one of my favorite definitions of an entrepreneur, um, and I cite Michael Hyatt here, although I've heard other people should have different versions of that same definition, mm -hmm. which is that an entrepreneur solves a problem for a profit. Right. And at face value, you're like, okay really makes sense solve the problem for a profit but then the implication there is that to be an entrepreneur is to really commit to a life of problems yes that's what i want to talk about yes. is that by choosing entrepreneurship to survive and thrive mm -hmm. you are choosing to take on and solve problems indefinitely yes how do you maintain energy and hope with so much resistance Whew. Well, um, that's a big question. This is why um, you bring me on the podcast is to ask great questions. <laughs> uh, so I think it's different for every person. I mean, but I mean, you have to have an infinite game you're playing where you feel like you're making a difference and you have a purpose behind what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But the reason why early on in the book, I talk a lot about the entrepreneur's paradox and the fact that by choosing to solve problems for the rest of your career, you are also choosing to surround yourself with problems for the rest of the year. Or re year, the, rest of the, rest, year, the rest of 2020. The rest of your life. The rest of, yeah. Uh, then that all comes back to just making it clear that you need to know what you're getting yourself into. That entrepreneurship right now in our culture is kind of glorified as like the new sexy thing to do is to like build your billion dollar unicorn and like, you know, do you know that? Oh, you're not familiar with that I'm term? I'm not familiar with this. Oh, yes. A unicorn is the term used in the uh, Silicon Valley world to refer to a company that is valued by investors at worth more than a billion dollars. Um, so like Atlassian was the first Australian unicorn. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, what I see in the glorified entrepreneurship is like the Instagram and TikTok reels where people are like pointing at things of like, I built my million dollar business, but all I do is dance on a screen. <laughs> and I'm like, I, is, that, is that what a unicorn is? Um, That's a little but it's, Yeah, it's a little, okay. Thank uh, you for defining a unicorn. Thank you. Uh, yeah, of course, happy to. Um, <laughs> But I think the reality is like, I believe that I believe that you should build a business to fuel your life rather than the other way around. And so that's part of the whole thrive formula. The whole thrive framework is that it's not just about surviving, right? That's mm -hmm. key, you know, um, off the top of my head, I think it's 80% of businesses fail within the first five years. Wow. And so the survive part isn't just about survive 2020 or survive 2021 or survive COVID-19. It's about survive the odds. I mean, it's about creating a business that can really last beyond that. And the thrive part is really about building a business that fuels your life. I mean, like where I, I, some people kind of dismiss, uh, there's this, there's this term that people say, uh, kind of in a derogatory way where they're like, oh, that's a lifestyle business. And what they mean is that's a small little business that's kind of cute that maybe you make a little bit of money from. But I've always resisted that. I've always, uh, been frustrated by that because the reality is every business should be a lifestyle business. Right. If you're not building a business to support your lifestyle, why are you in business in the first place? Because it's a lot of work, so there better be a reward. Well, even working at Core at Columbia here, I'm always, like, I express this in emails to leads all the time. Like, we want to support your business and your focus so that you can support your family. Yeah. Like, we want healthy businesses and, and watch you become millionaires, etc., so that you can bring your family with you and climb that together. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, but you were saying um, the resistance. Oh, you said something really good. What was it? Oh, thank I'm you. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure. It was all good. Um, um, I'm sorry. I don't know what I was going to say. It's okay. Just move forward. I had a really great tactic um, that I was going to pivot to. You. Um, but the resistance... Um, Great. Shall we just go to the next question? Let's do that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to also talk about the personal resistance with magnets. Okay. Um, so in your book, you talk about weak magnets versus strong magnets. 
Yes. And the question that I eventually wanted to get to, but you probably need to explain the, the magnetic poles, is what do you do with the haters as an entrepreneur? Do you want to jump to that? Let's, well, I mean, let's just address that question. Sure. Um, not much. I mean, you accept that they're part of the... I mean, actually, it's kind of similar to the whole point about problems. You kind of just accept that that's part of the... Uh, that's part of the math. It's just that, mm -hmm. like, the more people you reach and impact, the reality is the odds are you will interact with someone who's not, who's going to find something wrong with whatever you're doing. Yeah. Um, and it's not fun, but, you know, I try to give everyone a pass that they're just having a bad day. You know, so, like, anybody who says something negative or mean, everyone gets one pass. You know, respond kindly. Uh, if they respond again in a very mean way, I'll just either block them or ignore them. I mean, it's just the reality is just like, that's just, um, when they're ready to seek help, I can send them the number for a great therapist. Um, but that's not, my, that, that's not what I'm here for. Sure. Um, can you explain magnets within business? Yeah. So this actually comes with a section on courting your customer and the whole idea that the reality is, um, so, uh, Michael Hyatt actually has a great quote in the front of the book. Would you mind reading the endorsement that he gave for the book real quick. <clears throat> if you can focus on creating real solutions to real problems for real people, you'll have a clear advantage in the marketplace. Survive and Thrive can show you how. Thank you, my God. Um, so uh, this whole idea of creating real solutions for real, I'm sorry, real solutions to real problems for real people, mm -hmm. that's really a core framework throughout the book. And when I get to the real people part, that's where the magnets come in, which is this idea that a lot of times you'll tell, you'll ask someone like, okay, well, who is your business designed to serve or who do you want to help? And they'll say like, well, everyone, like I made this widget, this cool thing that anyone and everyone wants it. Right. But the reality is if everyone could use it, you probably are going to get no one's attention. And some of this actually comes back to physics. That's where I tie it into magnets in, in the book. Right. Um, is that the, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, I guess apparently thermodynamics, physics, I don't know. Apparently it's a theme. Um, but in physics, you know, you learn that a magnet doesn't just attract things. So we like magnets as a theory because we're like, oh yeah, I want to attract stuff to me. I want a magnetic brand. I want a magnetic business or whatever. But the reality is, you know, our kids have done this. Like take two magnets and try to, that, that are opposite energy and try to get them to like touch each other and they can't, you know, they'll get close, but they won't quite get there. That's because magnets attract and repel with, with more or less equal strength. In other words, for you to be a strong magnet in attracting something, you have to be a strong magnet in repelling as well. And so if you're not willing to repel anyone with your business, and I don't mean being going out of your, going out of your way to be rude or offensive, but I mean, picking a real people, picking real people that you can serve. Like, like, for example, let's just say your business is designed to serve working mothers. Mm -hmm. Well, then it's not designed to serve, you know, 65-year-old corporate executives. No. Um, I mean, I suppose unless they're working mothers, but odds are no. I doubt you know, it. Yeah. At least not with young it kids at the home. It would be a very home. small target audience. Right. At least not with young kids at the home. Like, maybe they're... Anyways, but yeah, so like, work, you know, working mothers with young kids at home. Okay. Okay, well, then if a 65-year-old corporate executive... Uh, runs across your website, they're going to be repelled by it, right? It's not for them. Right, it's not an offensive thing. It's just they bounce off of it, right? Exactly. And so that's a key part of choosing your real people, mm -hmm. uh, who you're going to help and serve, is being specific enough that you're repelling someone. Because if you're repelling no one, you're also going to be attracting no one. Interesting. Interesting. Um, it's one of those uh, things that I'm like, yeah, and oh. I like know. I know. It's hard. It's double sided, but I guess so is a magnet. So. Yes. Um, yeah. So I wanted to um, talk about how um, you told me a story once of a company in Japan that lasted a thousand years. Yeah. Do you remember the hotel, the boutique hotel in Japan? Yeah, I read about that in the book The Soul of the Entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, by David Sachs. It's up there on my shelf. The Soul of an Entrepreneur by David Sachs. And he talks about that. It's a really cool story about a business that lasted literally a thousand years. And it's just, it's, it's been passed down from person to person, you know, as insist. I mean, it's a right size business. Like they're mm -hmm. not, they're not trying to scale their business to, um, so now I'm doubting and I'm wondering if maybe I read about it in The Company of One by Paul Jarvis. I read a lot of books. I think it was company one. That sounds right. Sorry, Paul. Because he was talking about the one 
the whole idea that you could have that. So the whole idea of the book, the company of one, Paul gets in there is he talks about the fact that, um, like it's okay. It's kind of a go back to lifestyle business idea. Like you don't growth at all costs is kind of like why. Well, it's not sustainable. And it's not sustainable, but but also like like if you know for example like Harvard has such a good reputation. Well, if Harvard's so good, why don't they have a Harvard in every city? Right. Well, because that would kind of water down what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable. And the same thing goes with this hotel that uh, Paul shares the story about. Um, David's book is also wonderful, just different. Um, uh, Paul uh, shares this story um, about this to kind of really emphasize the fact that, like, this boutique hotel is in, is perfect. It's it's small. It's easy to systemize. They've got, if I remember correctly, they have, like, a hot springs, and mm -hmm. they have, like, 17 rooms, and... I was going to say it's less than 15. It's small, and it's beautiful, and people travel there. It's a destination. Literally, they have multi-generational customers. Mm -hmm. They're customers who go to stay there for vacation, whose, like, great-grandfather used to go there and stay there for vacation. And it's really cool That's things cool. That, that are possible because they're not trying to just go to 10 or 15 or 20 locations. They're just saying, like, this is the business. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really cool idea and just really encouragement. It's kind of countercultural right now to say, like, you don't have to grow. You don't have to be a unicorn. Um, you can be weird in other ways um, by really just building a business that fuels your life. Yeah, I, um, I, I feel like that the boutique hotel, I wish I knew the name of it, um, but it survives. It's survived a thousand years, and it's still thriving right. in its niche market, that it repels big change, that right. it attracts and so it survived. You know, a very target customer. I mean, it survived. Not just economic recession, mm -hmm. but like wars, currency changes, regime changes, mm -hmm. government reorganization. I mean, globalization. So many things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Japanese are known for writing when they uh, um, for writing a hundred year business plans. Like even today, like when they start a business today. They yeah. So like typically in the U.S., we're like, okay, let's make like a three to five year vision. It's it's common practice in Japan to create a 100 year company vision. And I think that's a really interesting idea. So we're not here to talk about just the longevity of business because obviously like a 100 year business is gonna last behind, beyond you. And that's cool, but that's not even not actually, and that's very possible with the framework in this book, Absolutely. by the way. But that's not even the point and, and necessarily is like, step one is like, you need to survive, right? You need to break, beat the odds, build a business that's profitable. And then you need to shift into really thriving and making sure that profitable business is fueling your lifestyle, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of making sure that you're spending your energy in the right ways, right. that you're not having to work 70, 80, 120 hours a week to, to do something yeah. crazy to grow your business, um, that instead you are um, really building a business that supports your lifestyle. Right. So that's a little bit about the book. I mean, I really hope that... Um, you know, I, I wrote this, like I mentioned, as a response to the economic crisis, right. to really trying to create an action plan so that people could create a business that supports their lifestyle and create one from scratch without relying on venture capital funding, without relying on a booming economy. These are principles which are meant to apply, you know, in any industry, in any economy. So... So, my next question... Yeah. Is if these principles are... This framework works for any business. So how do they tell where they're at in their business? And then how do they find out what their next steps are? Well, that's a great question. If only there was an assessment. Hmm. Yes. Um, so you can actually go to yourthrivescore.com, so yourthrivescore.com, and take a brief assessment, which is okay. based on the, the principles in this book, which will give you a score, a numerical score about where your business is at right now um, in terms of, you know, that's true even if you're at the very beginning stages. Maybe you're just in the idea stage. Well, you're probably going to have a lower score, but that, that's not a bad thing. That just shows you that now you know what you need to do to grow. Right. So this, so after you take the assessment, it will tell you which areas of your business need attention. So the different areas, areas would be like marketing and finance. Yeah, marketing, sales, and finance are kind of the three broadest areas of the business. That, I mean, it's fair to say this book and this, mm -hmm. this whole framework really focuses on the integration of marketing, sales, and finance. And so you're going to be scored um, in those areas based on different questions. Um, but the, really the detailed how to improve all of those, I mean, the, the assessment itself will give you a snapshot of where you're at right now, right. which is good. So you can track that and you can see, okay, I can improve that. But really the step-by-step -step guide for how to do that, uh, to make sure that not just your score improves, but also your, uh, you know, balance sheet, your bank account, right. uh, that that's all in the book. So survive and thrive book.com, mm -hmm. uh, the ebook is available today. Uh, and you can pre-order the paper book, the paperback. Uh, it will be out later this year, uh, currently slated for July in bookstores 
all over the world. I'm so excited to walk into a bookstore and see your name on the book. But I'm more excited about how this book will help people now, mm. as we have it, you know, locally at our bookshop in Columbia. But we'll also have it, we have it online today, and we'll have it in stores everywhere in July. Very soon. Yes, just, I'm excited about how many people can benefit from this framework. Well, thank you so much for joining me to talk about the book a little bit today, and um, I look forward to hearing from everybody that gets a copy, and, uh, puts it into practice. I mean, I, you know, yeah, I want the book sales and I want the reviews, but really what I want is I want to see people put these principles into practice and to build a business to, you know, maybe you've got an existing business and right now you're going to put these principles into practice and you're going to double your revenue or triple or quadruple. I mean, maybe you're going to, we hope so. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you put these principles into practice, I genuinely believe you can 10 X your revenue. Um, if you're, if you're brand new and just getting started, then this might be how you get your first dollar or your first thousand or your first $10,000. Mm -hmm. Those are stories that I can't wait to hear about because I genuinely view entrepreneurship as the best path to eradicating generational poverty and making the world a better place. And um, this is one step, one milestone along that mission. Yeah, you're here to, to put into practice what you've learned, to teach what you've learned, um, but also to build your business with your family lifestyle in mind, you know, like you're surviving yes. and thriving yourself in your business and in your family life, and you want to do that with everyone. You heard it from my wife, so <laughs> <laughs> that's been verified and backed up. So, well, thank you for joining me again, Rachel, and thank you all of you. Uh, thank you, listener, and uh, please, once again, go to surviveandthrivebook.com to get your copy and keep up the good work. Um, we uh, have a babysitter calling right now, and uh, <laughs> Shall I you should that? take that. Okay. Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> you good?